One. Eliezer wiped sweat from his forehead and studied the line of men streaming toward the bank of the pool. This pool, over which much blood was about to be shed, was the water source for the town of Gibeon nearby, and also for much of the region. It was wide, and in the spring it filled to the brim. It was the most strategically important water site in the central hill country of the lands of the Israelites, and that is why men armed for battle were now gathered there. There were hundreds of men. Eliezer had difficulty counting them because they constantly shifted position. This, he knew, was being done deliberately because their commander wanted to disguise their size. This could only mean that their commander was experienced and competent. Moving troops without standard formations was a good way to hide the size of the force. Eliezer clenched his jaw. Surely the commander for whom he scanned the enemy forces would not be leading a simple border scouting company. His presence there was both dangerous and unnecessary, unless he knew he could not trust his own men. Just as David did not trust Joab, currently standing on Eliezer's left. See him? asked Shama quietly, sliding a pouch from his side to his front. No, said Joab. He might not be there, Eliezer said. Abner would not miss a chance to take new ground. He is there, Joab replied, his eyes darting up toward the stone-covered ridge near the pool. He might be scouting from higher up, but that would be unlike him. He will want to be in the middle of this. Eliezer wiped his forehead, irritated. He was not a tall man, but he had a powerful chest and arms that were tightly knotted with muscle and twitched with nervous energy. Like the other warriors, his hair and beard were cut shorter than most men for freedom of movement in close fighting. His tunic was light and short, reaching only to his thighs. His back was crisscrossed with weapon scabbards. His two companions in battle, Josheb and Shama, were as different from one another as an olive from an ox. Josheb was the leader, slender and calm, quick with his wit and his blades. He possessed both blazing passion and calm contemplation, depending on the need. Despite his unassuming and ordinary physical appearance, his feats on battlefields and training arenas were so legendary that scribes had approached him about recording them. Josheb frequently sparred with entire companies, by himself. He moved so fast and had such endless reserves of physical stamina that to contain him was akin to containing a stampeding herd. But he was best known among the fighting men for his laugh. Josheb knew well the value of humor to keep men moving when all hope seemed lost. If there was a laugh to be had at the expense of someone else, Josheb never failed to exploit it, and his most frequent target was Shama. Shama was the largest and most physically imposing man in their ranks. His weapons were so heavy that only he could carry them. Somber, Devoted to the law of the God of Jacob, he was awkward and ill at ease when speaking to others, especially women. Even when presented daughters as war prizes, he shied away and refused to marry them, offending many patriarchs in the process, much to David's annoyance and Josheb's endless ridicule. The men considered him odd. He prayed much like David did, out loud and with everyone watching. He fell asleep at random hours of the day, sometimes even while standing up. His demeanor made it easy to overlook his extraordinary strength, both physical and spiritual. They were known as the Three, the deadliest of all of the Lion of Judah's fighters. Maybe Abner will listen, said Josheb. Eliezer nodded. The bloodshed must stop. Not even the most savage of tribal men, men such as Joab, wanted war between the house of Saul and the house of David to last forever. The bond of kinship that bound the tribes was nearly gone as it was. Early in Saul's reign there had been a brief period of eased tensions among the twelve tribes, but since the old king's death the country had fractured between those northern tribes loyal to Saul and his line and the southern tribe of Judah with its new ruler, David. Neither liked the other, but all knew that disunity would eventually mean certain defeat at the hands of their mutual enemies. The troops across the pool began to sit in ranks along the bank of the water, demonstrating a semblance of order for the first time as section leaders began to organize their men. There appeared to be about six hundred men with weapons, 
not counting their supply and logistics troops unseen at the rear. Eliezer looked at their own force. Forty-seven of them. Good men, most of them. Joab was commanding the small force, but Eliezer, Shama, and Joshib had been sent by David to keep watch over his nephew. Three sons of David's sister, Zeruiah, were here. Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Joab was a capable leader, a brilliant strategist and brave warrior. But he was also vain and easily angered. Abishai, however, was respected by the three. He was silent, brave, and humble, a stark contradiction to his brother Joab. Eliezer liked him almost as much as Joshab and Shammah. But Asahel, Zeruiah's youngest, had every poor quality of Joab's and none of Abishai's admirable ones. He was foolish, pushed to the heights of arrogance by his exceptional physical abilities. Asahel was the fastest runner Eliezer had ever seen, and his capacity for endurance during training sessions was seemingly endless. The soldiers across the pool crouched together along the bank in a mass of wool cloaks and weapons. Even from this distance it was clear that there were no men of Gilead, nor men of Ashur. Ephraimites, the largest of the northern tribes and the one most likely to participate in a maneuver such as this, were nowhere to be seen. There was, in fact, only one tribe present, and this concerned Eliezer so much that he wondered if they should withdraw before anything tragic happened. The men facing them were Benjamites. Benjamin, the smallest tribe, was also the lineage of the dead King Saul. It had been hoped by those in Judah that the Benjamites would defect to David. If the tribe of the former king changed its alliances because Saul's son Ishbosheth was an ineffective and weak ruler, then the other northern tribes might follow suit. This had not yet happened. Eliezer and the rest of David's force were crouched among the rocks and spread out to give the appearance of size hoping to fool the Benjamites into believing that they were just a scouting party of a larger force. Why hasn't he stepped out yet? asked Eliezer. He's looking for David, replied Joshib. He will come out soon enough when he realizes it's only us. David stopped coming on scouting missions last year. Abner knows that. Eliezer blinked. He watched Joab from the corner of his eye. Wish David were here now. The pool became quiet. Insects chirped. A few men cleared their throats. There were no taunts, none of the usual jeering or clanking as fighting men readied themselves. Neither side wanted to be standing opposite other Hebrews, and yet here they were. Who else do you see? asked Joab. By another Benjamite is to the right, behind the archers. If he is here, then Rechab is here as well. Seems like an awful lot of archers, said Shama, squinting. They're all archers. They're Benjamites. It looks like they have other weapons as well. Abner has been training them. None of those men look like they have seen battle, said Joshib. Eliezer nodded. While David's warriors were gazing calmly and awaiting orders, the men from the north were clearly nervous. They were quiet, but hands were shifting and throats clearing, revealing anxiety. Commanders, still standing while their troops sat, gripped bows and sword hilts tight. They do look green, Eliezer said. Most of Abner's army was destroyed at Gilboa. Of course they're green, said Joab. But Abner's army has been fighting Philistine armies all season. Surely some of these men fought in those battles, and they must know how much they outnumber us, said Shama. Eliezer replied, You're too humble. Didn't you see the look on that boy's face as we were coming into Gibeon when he heard who we were? If people in the villages have heard the mighty deeds of the lion's men, how much more so the army? Abner's veterans might still be patrolling the valleys in case of a Philistine invasion. These might be all he has, Joab said. Eliezer closed his eyes and let the sun's warmth calm him. Gibeon was disputed territory, strategically important because of its well on the trading route. He shook his head raked his fingers through his beard. Joab would not relinquish the ground. Neither would Abner. Hebrew sons would die this day.